Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Friends here and friends joining us uh, remotely. I think we got to press a button there. Uh, I'm, I, I often forget to introduce myself, which I think is a good sign because who cares, you know, like it's not the point. Uh, we're here together with these teachings and the Dharma, but uh, for the purposes of my identity project, I'm Eve Ekman, your teacher tonight. And yeah, always, this is a highlight of my week to be here with you all um, and to really dig into these teachings and this writing of this book. No problem if this is your first time and you have no idea what book I'm talking about. It's a really simple book and illustration of the historical and autobiographical life of the Buddha. And through these teachings of um, how the Buddha is actually discovering his own awake nature, we get to discover it with him. So not just commentary and ideas, but the actual path that he walked. So the book is called Old Path, White Clouds. It's compiled by Thich Nhat Hanh. And here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, you know, our goal is to, as much as possible, directly experience ourselves, these teachings we're learning about. Tonight, especially, tonight, that's really our focus. How do we not just hear the words or hear the instructions? How do we really experience what's being offered to us, make these ideas feel alive within us? Um, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer-run organization. And that is just a, a wonderful thing to remind ourselves of whenever we're gathered together. We are here truly out of the generosity of others. So there's not, you know, a, a big institution behind us. There's no um, kind of sense of guiding teachers who want this place to be a certain way. The place is co-created. Um, and some of the, the guiding values of this place is to create a sense where we can be in dialogue where we can have that direct experience of the teachings and where we can do so as much as possible in a way that feels like we are Kalyana Mitra, we are spiritual friends. These teachings, we, you know, I've read this book four times. You, you could go home and read the book, right? But we come here together because there's something additive about not only hearing other people's point of view, but creating the communities we want to be living in, right? And it's a little easier in these once a week voluntary participation. Like no one's like, who didn't do the dishes, right? But still we can kind of exercise the type of communication and connection that we want in our world here together. Um, it, it brings me a lot of joy. And a lot of folks in this room are engaged in variety of social ju justice and social activism um, causes and commitments. And there's such an interesting thread through a lot of those circles that I get to um, sit upon and learn about. And that is the radical power of creating communities of care, creating a beloved community. Um, the revolution is not going to be through capitalism, right? The revolution is through one another, you know, engaging at something at a level that isn't about transaction and exchange. So I just, um, lot, you know, putting a lot of heaviness on our gathering together, but just sharing with you my intentions, you know, and why I show up here and why I think it matters that we're here together. It's an alternative way of gathering, voluntary participation, everyone just kind of coming together around these ideas that, that are helpful. Um, and that hopefully can be revolutionary. <clears throat> so this evening we have, we're on chapter 32, making our way. It's a really big book for those of you who haven't noticed. And this, I'm, I'm trying to give a little bit of that beautiful circular redundancy of storytelling, but not too much, right? Because truly there's like, a lot of overlap in these chapters. And this chapter is such a beautiful one. It's such a well-known, I'd say, aphorism um, of the Buddhist canon, which is the finger is not the moon. Maybe some folks have heard that term before. And it's a really interesting way of describing how we can get caught up in our ideas and our concepts about spiritual practice, so much so that we forget 
what the point of our spiritual practice is. And the analogy is like, that's as though someone was trying to point out the moon, but we got so fixated on looking at their fingers that we forgot to look at the moon. Right. And it's so interesting, again, reading the historical life of the Buddha, obviously he didn't have Buddhism to go by, right? Like he created Buddhism and throughout all of his early sutras and um, teachings, he keeps saying, forget the words, forget the concepts. The only thing they're good for is scaffolding so that you can directly experience your own liberation. You can directly see and feel that everything is coming together as separate parts and then experienced and dependent co-arising. And so it's, it's a, uh, yeah, ironic. It might even be, um, yeah, like a bit hypocritical to be reading teachings of the Buddha about not following teachings. But I think there's something we can really learn from this idea and this this kind of no doctrine doctrine, as he calls it. And tonight, what we'll start with is a meditation that we did probably about a month back. This is mindfulness of feelings really examining our experience of what's happening through our our senses and really recognizing that what's going on in our senses is almost immediately met by our perception of whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Like we already have some good motorcycles ready to give us material. (laughs) So what we're hearing, what we're feeling in our body, like I just had an itch and I totally mindlessly just scratched it. Right. But when we are meditating, we're going to notice like, Ooh, what is that itch? Oh, it's unpleasant. Okay. And then we can, by all means in this practice, itch it. And then notice that relief, right? Oh, it feels so good to scratch the itch. So slowing down enough for us to see that there is something that is just sensory experience. And then there's our perception. Not making that a problem, but helping us unpack that it's our attribution of something being good or something being bad. That's kind of like, you know, bare ingredients of samsara. The bare ingredients of what makes us chasing towards what we want, trying to avoid what we don't want. Um, So I love this practice, this Vedana practice called mindfulness of feelings, um, because it really gives us this opportunity to not just have the fingers pointing at the moon, but really to experience that sense of what is it like to have, you know, sounds and sights and touches, maybe even smells and really notice right that moment where we contribute to our experience by deciding or perceiving something as pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Last week, um, we did a bit of leaning into spacious awareness. And I'd like us to continue working with spacious awareness for the next couple of weeks. As I mentioned last week, it's a really, can be a really challenging term both spacious, then awareness, then putting them together. Um, And one way to describe it, and it's often described as this, you know, kind of primordial nature or this sense of uh, unconfigured awareness. Any word that I use will be totally insufficient, but the felt experience is as though it's no longer you, the meditator, observing phenomena. There's just experience. It's a a sense of being fully present with our awareness, not directly oriented anywhere. And when that happens, we can feel a sense of openness. And we experience a sense of openness, not just in our mind, between our ears and behind our eyes, but through the whole body. Um, So someone mentioned last week that, uh, you know, a sense of dissolving in the body can happen when we get into that and that you don't get an extra gold star and you don't fail if you don't have a dissolving through the body, but just as a, like, what am I looking for? I find with spacious awareness that it can be really hard to just drop right into it. I mean, that is Dzogchen practice. We're not going to directly do that here. I find it's nice to kind of make our way there. And so last week we made our way there by doing a benefactor practice by really kind of saturating our mind and heart and body with compassion. And then once we had done that, we were settled in enough that the spaciousness is a little more accessible. 
And this week, we're going to kind of tune in to this moment to moment sensory experience and then move into that spacious awareness. One other concept that can be helpful to hold in mind is when we're practicing the Vedana, when we're noticing um, our sensory experience, we do so with what's called bare attention. And it's a, uh, I love that term. You know, I think that's a, a direct translation. You hear many teachers use that term, bear attention. Um, and it really is, it's describing a kind of, it's like an unadorned, un, uncomplicated way of just noticing what's happening. Right. Without a lot of, and analysis or reason why. So when one of the motorcycles goes by is here, because probably will, right? Our bare attention notices the rumble, the tone, the kind of frequency. We then notice, oh, I, I don't like that sound, or I do like that sound. We would move outside of bare attention if we started thinking, I wonder what kind of bike that is, or I wonder if that's that same guy going back and forth. I think I heard that one five minutes ago. Then we're getting into analysis, extrapolation. So our bare attention, just simple. Here's the sound. Here's my experience of the sound. So that's quite simple, but it can be really nice to kind of prime the pump with these ideas. And so I'm going to read us just one kind of really beautiful um, one beautiful, I'd, I'd hope, inspiration about this idea uh, in general of kind of teaching through direct experience. So this is the Buddha saying, my teaching is not a philosophy and is the result of direct experience. The things I say come from my own experience and you can confirm them all by your own experience. I teach that all things are impermanent and without a separate self. This I have learned from my own direct experiences, and you can too. I teach that all things depend on each other, arise, develop, and pass away. Nothing is created from a single original source. I've directly experienced this truth, and you can also. My goal is not to explain the universe, but to help guide others to have a direct experience of reality. Words cannot describe reality. Only direct experience enables us to see the, few, the true face of reality. Just love that. Only direct experience enables us to see the true face of reality. So with that, let's give ourselves a moment to see if we can connect with that true face of reality. So find a posture that's supportive giving more of this practice. I know it's been a really warm day for most of us if we've been in the Bay Area. So you can, might need a little vitality for our practice. There's a, a really lovely and simple practice taught by many Tibetan teachers. It's kind of a, a dropping practice. Has anyone here just done the drop practice before? So it's, it's quite simple. I'm going to move the microphone a little, but I think folks at home can see, see me. And you just raise your hands up. And drop. And when you drop, like notice the attention and awareness right after you drop. It gets a little brighter. You're like right here. So we'll try that twice more. Raising our hands together and drop. And once more together. And And then if it's comfortable, letting your eyes gently close and giving yourself a little space to move the spine around, maybe to the left and the right and forward and back and noticing if there is a center point that feels upright. Giving yourself a moment to really feel as though the spine was like a stack of gold coins. 
And then gently inhaling shoulders up to the ears and exhaling them down the back, feeling a spaciousness in the chest. And twice more, inhaling up and exhale, broadening the chest, almost lifting the chest upward one more time. Finding a place for the hands to rest where the shoulders can feel at ease. So that kind of earth pressing posture with palms open on the thighs or folded in the lap. I'm taking a moment here to bring our full attention and awareness in the body. And gently following with our attention the natural rhythm of the breath. Breathing in, simply just knowing we are breathing in by feeling the breath in the body. And breathing out, knowing we are breathing out. To know that we are breathing means we are not thinking about breathing. We're not imagining breathing. We're feeling this deep sense of the body being breathed. And when thoughts or memories or images arise, you just relax and return to the breath. Inviting the quality of stability and stillness to the body. The stillness, of course, of movement, We're not walking or moving. But the stillness also has a choice. Allowing ourselves to fully arrive here. Nowhere else we need to be in this moment. Nothing else we need to do in this moment. Really bringing the full stillness of body and mind.
and to help us settle the mind a bit further, bringing our attention and awareness more narrowly to the sensations of breath through the belly. Noticing as the belly rises, noticing as the belly gently falls back. And letting our attention fully ride the breath. If your attention has been captured elsewhere, really notice, are you feeling a sense of speediness, many thoughts? If so, maybe focus a bit more on the exhale. But if you're experiencing maybe a sense of dullness or lethargy, focus more on the inhale. So using introspection to really help us Bring a vividness and presence to this noticing of the breath at the belly. Now that we've settled in a bit to our body, breath, let's consider our intention for being here this evening. The intention could be a single word, like connection, inspiration, compassion. It could be a phrase, something that is a guiding light to us throughout our life could be a phrase that just emerges right now. And letting ourselves have this beautiful touch point of intention. And if your intention doesn't already include others, consider that our time here together, our collective intention, is always in service of the liberation of all beings, which starts, of course, with small acts of generosity and compassion and understanding. Inviting and igniting that flame of care for other beings here right now. Other beings with loud motorcycles, other beings known and unknown.
And as we shift into this Vedana practice, we begin by calibrating our senses. We're beginning by really considering what we can experience through the sense portal of touch and sensation. We could gently wiggle our fingers and notice the sensations of movement. And then notice the stillness after that movement. Take a moment and allow yourself to freely explore all the tactile sensations in this field of the body. And then continuing the calibration of connecting to our sensory experience by noticing sounds. And the whole amazing tapestry of sounds. For those of us here in the center, the sounds on the street, but also the sounds of appliances like air, refrigerator, What is it like to really receive sound? What is that information experienced as? And then shifting our attention and awareness. If your eyes are closed, noticing just the subtle patterns of light and darkness behind closed eyes. Being careful to not strain as we are observing And then giving ourselves a moment to allow the eyes to be gently opened, softly focused. Gazing downward and receiving what can be received through this visual portal. Shapes and colors, movement. Gently allowing the eyes to close. Bringing our attention and awareness to smell and taste, which might be quite subtle. Maybe we can smell our own shampoo or some other scent that's lightly near us. Maybe there's the taste of tea or recent dinner, or just a sense of the viscosity in the mouth.
And then allowing ourselves to experience all of these sense portals, a tactile, <clears throat> auditory, what we can notice of the visual, smell and taste, and paying attention to whatever comes to our awareness and whether or not we experience it as something that is pleasant, something we like, something unpleasant that we don't like, or just neutral. And no further engagement is bringing our bare attention to sensory experience and noticing how we judge or attribute this experience. This bare attention is in the present moment completely. It's not anticipating what's coming next. It's not hanging on to what has already happened. Experiencing the sensory phenomena right in the moment. Maybe there's a lot of neutral, no problem. Maybe there's a longing with the present, the pleasant. Also, no problem. As much as possible, having this relaxed, bare attention, moment to moment. And for a couple more moments, really refreshing our interest. Maybe noticing in the body, just these subtle areas that may feel unpleasant. And noticing the shifts and changes of energy in the body, maybe pleasant or just neutral.
And then recommitting to our posture, really feeling the dignity of our upright spine. Maybe we want to pull our shoulders back a bit, feel our chin resting evenly on top of our neck. And having this sense of leaning back into a more spacious awareness. In this spacious awareness, we're not trying to push anything away. There's still sounds and still maybe visual imprints, still sensations in the body. But our focus is not on them. It's broader. We can feel a sense of our awareness above us and below us, surrounding us. Relaxed and yet vivid, luminous, spacious. As though instead of observing these sensory experiences, we were simply being with and of these sensory experiences. No matter how many times you get carried away, you can come back and click in, leaning back, feeling that sense, spacious awareness. Gently placing one palm on the heart and one on the belly. Reconnecting to this body, this moment. Feeling a sense of connection, shared breath, which the beings gathered here this evening.
<clears throat> Thank you for your practice. Feel free to stretch, move around as needed. Questions, reflections, objections. Yeah, any? No, this is not a new practice for many of you, but yeah, yeah, just curious. Is there a, a sensory aspect that felt more rich or alive for folks, easier to connect with? Yeah. You talk about it in sound, mm -hmm. especially the sound around the center. Yeah. But I often use that as a method to kind of bring myself back. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, you know, I think there's there's a lot of different ways. I think, and in this practice, you know, the focus is really kind of giving ourselves an opportunity to recognize our own, our own judgment upon the sound. So I think you can use the sound as just every, if you just, if we just sat here silently for 30 minutes, you just use sound as a reminder, like, come back, come back. Lynn and I were talking at dinner about this beautiful book by Aldous Huxley called Islands. It's his last novel. It's a utopic novel, wonderful land where everybody's enlightened. It's my God, seems really far away. But one key feature of Islands is that all the birds in this island are trained to say, pay attention. <laughs> it's awesome i mean it's like the opposite of notifications right now are like this similar you know but the pay attention is like remember your true nature remember your true nature and i think we can use the sounds here as a reminder in that way um because otherwise it can drive us nuts and anyone who's who's practiced you know like this fantasy like i'm gonna go to like burma or thailand and practice like Buddhism, like real Buddhism. And it's like so loud for sure. Like not quiet. Right. So it's not this like remote, removed, you know, isolated bubble. Um, and you really learn to use sound as practice. And you realize this idea that we can't practice when it's noisy is just a barrier to practice. I mean, I like it quiet. I'm not going to lie. I actually like noise. Okay. Say more. It's just, it, it helps bring bring my focus to like what's just going on right there now right it's not really i don't have any judgment around it generally yeah um i've been concerned about what's going on outside. yes especially at the old center <laughs> yeah but you know mostly i it's just i kind of just use it as instead of around yeah or using both totally um it was like a g but yeah, not cheating. No, I, one of my favorite uses of insight timer is that you can set bells. So I have like a, you know, 24 minute Gatika practice and a bell goes off every four minutes. And that really helps for me also, like, I think in a similar way. And I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. It, it feels like... It was like so silent, everyone, and like collectively holding that silence. Yeah. One point focus together, and I'm coming like in and out. Yeah. And like, I feel like holding it. Mm, that's beautiful. Can, could folks online hear that? There was a note. Um, this idea that you know, here we could really, she could really have a sense of, we were all kind of holding that single point of focus. And even when her attention went away and came back, that single point of focus was being held. And it's true. I, I bet that there's some way to measure that, right? But it does feel like there's a different, like energy, like almost like a different gravity in the room when everybody's paying attention. 
Um, and it is, it's, it's kind of supportive alone. We fall away from attention, right. And we come back, but there's not that same, um, yeah, kind of, it's almost like a momentum. Yeah. I see some other heads nodding. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any, and how about spacious awareness? How's that going? <laughs> anybody, anybody feel that? There's a good horn. A good horn? Yeah, a good horn. There's a good horn at one point. Yes. Yeah. Did that help the spacious awareness? Yeah. It was pretty, everything else was neutral. That was, that was a good one. Oh, that was a pleasant. Was a pleasant one. Yes. <laughs> I heard that horn. Yeah. <laughs> and how about like the kind of backing into like a more open experience? Anybody feel that in a bodied way? Other, otherwise? just easier to sit easier to sit much easier to sit yeah yeah right because there's not the literal like uh literal and um psychological agitation right so not the like where am i like almost as though yeah we can just be it's it's so true i've not thought about it that way yeah yeah yes um, i definitely I, sure just in case yeah it wasn't the whole time but for a few minutes i i definitely got to a place that was beyond thinking about you know pain so um everything um instead of being separate instead of having sounds out there and the feelings in my body and the things i was experiencing it, it was just all one thing and it was it was without interruption hmm. and beautiful and gentle and soft and a place that I felt like I, I wanted to, you know, stay there, hmm. <laughs> you know, which um, a little bit of that craving might have been why I couldn't hold on to it. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of uh, efforting there, but, um, but yeah, I, I got someplace. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, a little glimpse of that. <laughs> It's, it can, you know, like, I do believe it's enough to disrupt our entire capitalist system, yeah. right? If everybody had a little taste of that, be like, whoa, like that's the good stuff, right? And it is, it's hard to reside there. And especially because for most of our waking hours, we like completely counter that type of experience. And so it, it is hard for us to set up camp, right? We can like taste it, but then it goes away and... Um, but I do think it's really confirming if we can have that sense of, wow, like everything and it feels good and we're here. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Any, oh, I see a hand. Hello. Can't see your name. Oh yeah. Great. I'm not sure. Are you, are you unmuting? Oh. Oh, we still can't hear you quite yet. Can you unmute? I like the gestures. Oh, there we go. Cool. <laughs> I couldn't unmute. Um, so I wanted to share that. Um, so during the sit, the sounds for me were um, sort of in conflict. I had this really um, sort of pleasant feeling that was arising from the sound of my wind chimes. But at the same time, <laughs> there was this jarring sort of feeling from my dog. My large dog was barking really loud at the same time, loudly. And um, so it almost forced me but it sort of made that clearing a real refuge um to mm -hmm. sort of rest although the the chimes are pleasant the barking is a little unpleasant so to just detach from both of them is yes. very um, um very attractive and so um uh i found that um and then you know to bring in the the sort of the the visual of the wind and the trees mm. and um the sensation of being on the cushion and all the stuff 
again, just reinforce that whole sort of resting right in that awareness. And it's just, it's a very nice, peaceful place. And yes, it would be nice to prolong, prolong that. Um, yeah. Thank you for describing that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it sounds borderline cacophony, right? You know, you're having the pleasant and the unpleasant and it is, um, you know, as our our dear friend and teacher here, Tig O'Malley, loves this term, the holding both and to have a direct experience of holding both. And does it, does it actually become neutral? Like, not really, right? It, but you're saying that there was a way of detaching or leaning back away from the thing you're liking and the thing you're avoiding. And, you know, I think again, with this practice, the purpose isn't just to recognize all the disturbances in our attention and awareness, but to really see how quickly, right, almost instantaneously, we determine something to be pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, and I had a lot of neutral that I was like, oh, boring, right? And I was like, wait, maybe this is good. Oh, now it's pleasant, right? But it's neutral is so, such a, you know, an unfamiliar um, aspect of most of our palettes. Like we're not hanging out in neutral a lot. Like, cause we have so many things to distract us away from neutral. So neutral can be a great practice. Yeah. So any other thoughts or questions before we get to this beautiful chapter? Okay. We got some, now it's like all the sounds that come. I'm like, oh man, I wish that would have happened during practice. I really, I was like, come on neighbors, come on neighbors. That's like a good, um, we had some, at the old center, we had some really loud neighbors. Um, it was like impressive. Um, so nothing, yeah, almost cabinet, yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, this is just, it's such a sweet chapter. It's, it's not that surprising that, um, the finger pointing at the moon. I mean, who's heard that in a Buddhist teaching at some point or another? It just is like a, it's a really sticky one. Um, Bruce Lee also says it in Enter the Dragon. Um, it's like, I think he's, I can't remember exactly what he's describing, but you know, some way to become much more adept in your, in your fighting. And the the way that it comes up is again you know we're meeting buddha this is still only like a year his first year of teaching and this is when he's starting to attract crowds and crowds of people everywhere he goes people offer him uh, land and other teachers who have other spiritual communities just in mass become um, students of the buddha so he's well over 2000 um, kind of in his sangha at this point and especially when the senior teachers of other spiritual communities migrate over to, to learn with the Buddha, everything gets a little stirred up. So when Sariputta and Moggallana, who came into, um, into the Buddha Sangha, but they were really senior students of another teacher, they brought that senior teacher with them. And he wants to have a kind of debate with the Buddha. Uh, he really wants to challenge him. And he says... What is your teaching and what are your doctrines? For my own part, I dislike all doctrines and theories. I don't subscribe to any at all. And the Buddha smiled and asked, do you subscribe to your doctrine of not following any doctrines? Do you believe in your doctrine of non-believing? I, I, I just love that, right? It's just this challenge. And I don't know about you all, but um, spiritual practice certainly is a central part of my life and it can make other people feel uncomfortable, right? If that's not their practice and they're like, no, I don't, I don't do that. I'm not into that. And then I, I love this idea of thinking, oh, is that your stance? Is that your religion? You know, like not being into spirituality. And I guess. It's a, it's a really provocative statement. You know, people often confuse Buddhism for like a, a religious belief, you know, that there is a single thing and it's the truth. When all the chapters up until now and spoiler alert, all the chapters from here on out 
it's it says that there is no one thing it's actually recognizing the interdependence of all things right and that's not really a doctrine it's an observation um which the way we get buddhism here if you go to like buddhism in thailand mm -hmm. somewhere else yeah giant golden yes it's very different than the philosophical version. Of yes. It's actually the religion on the ground. Yeah. Very much religion. Yes. But didn't start that way. Yeah. No, and I... Right. Neither did Christianity. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's interesting, um, you know, there, there is this like whole series of like meta commentary by senior teachers on what the Buddha would think of all these little sects of Buddhism now. Like there's so many different sects of Buddhism. There's different traditions and different sub traditions. And, um, and, you know, one of the core aspects is that the Buddha does say is these teachings have to change. That's why he didn't want them written. I, nothing was written in the time of the Buddhas after he died because he thought if we write it, we're going to treat it like doctrine, like let it continue and evolve. Something so different was an oral tradition. When something is spoken, it kind of shifts and changes over time. It like adapts to what's happening. Um, so, and uh, this, this uh, teacher taken aback says, whether I believe or don't believe is of no importance. And the Buddha spoke gently. Once a person is caught by belief in a doctrine, he loses all his freedom. When one becomes dogmatic, he believes his doctrine is the only truth and that all other doctrines are heresy. Disputes and conflict all arise from narrow views. They can extend endlessly, wasting precious time and sometimes leading to, leading to war. Attachment to views is the greatest impediment to the spiritual path. Like, really? Like, what about aversion and anger and delusion? Like, I, I, it's, that's a really strong statement that attachment to views is the greatest impediment on the spiritual path. Anyone like think why? Like, what does that mean? Like, why it would be an attachment to the view? Yeah. Creates division. Creates division. Yeah. So like people believe one thing, don't believe another. Why? Why else? Yes. I mean, I think about this sometimes. I, mean, I think attachment to any system or view is the core of comfort. Kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. And also internal as well. Right. Um, you have these systems, the arguments, that the world presents to itself different. And that creates a right. So uh, if folks online didn't hear that this uh, this like kind of root of conflict is when we have our belief in one system and then the world meets us with something different. Um, and then there's internal conflict. There could be external conflict. Yeah. And, you know, like what if my view is that I believe in compassion? How's that going to be an impediment? pretty self-righteous about it you can get self-righteous about it yep mm -hmm. judge people that you don't have compassion judge others yeah yeah and his he says bound to narrow views one becomes so entangled that it is no longer possible to let the door of truth open so this reminds me, this will come in a couple chapters uh, along, but this analogy of the pot that's over full. So when we think about what is the best way for us to be a vessel for the teachings, and he gives an example of what's not a great way to be a vessel. That would be a pot that is over full, a pot with a hole in it, or a pot that's turned upside down. And the pot that's over full is one that is it's already gone to all the workshops, has every book, has like... 20 shawls and like, you know, all the kind of vestments, right. And ideas about practice and there's no room, right. We're just over full. And so that's what he's really pointing out here is one becomes so entangled, like right, in these ideas and beliefs that it's no longer possible to let the door of truth open. And the door of truth is from our direct experience, right. We're so entangled in these ideas 
that we're not actually going back to the root, which isn't the words. The root is the experience. And then he tells this really just like incredibly depressing story. Um, and I, I appreciate the storytelling. There's a lot of storytelling in this book as a way to illustrate these themes. And so this one is uh, about a young widower who lived with his five-year-old son and he cherished his son more than his own life. One day he left his son at home while he went out on business. While he was gone, uh, robbers came and burned the entire village. They kidnapped his son. And when the man returned home, he found the charred corpse of a young child laying beside his burned house. He assumed it was the body of his own son. He wailed in grief and cremated what was left because he loved his son so much. He put the ashes in a bag and carried it with him everywhere he went. Months later, his son managed to escape and make his way home. He arrived in the middle of the night and knocked on the door. At that moment, his father was hugging the bag of ashes and weeping, and he refused to open the door, even when the child called out that he was his son. He believed his own son was dead, and the child knocking on the door was some neighborhood child mocking his grief. Finally, his son had no choice but to wander off on his own. Thus, father and son lost each other forever. I know. I know. Come on. But it's, you know, he's saying, um, if we're attached to some belief and we hold it as the absolute truth, we may day, we one day find ourselves in a similar situation. Thinking we already possess the truth will be unable to open our minds, the, the door of our minds to receive the truth, even if it comes knocking at us. I just love that. Yeah, Jimmy. Well, the, the thing that I find interesting is, one is that's, that's really true for big stuff, for like, you know, these, these sort of um, huge beliefs that we hold and can keep us from knowing a deeper, larger, but it's also true moment by moment. Yeah. If I'm really attached to what I think is going on right in front of me, then I'm going to miss what's actually going on right in front of me. I mean, I can be lost as far as what I think is happening, what's happening inside my head, yeah. as opposed to what's What's actually happening? Oh, yeah. That minute by minute kind of attachment to what I think is going on, as opposed to the minute by minute observation, yeah. direct experience of what's actually going on, keeps me in delusion. Yeah. Yep. Beautifully said. Yeah. And I think that relates so deeply also to, you know, these core beliefs of deficiency, not enough. Right. And we can just feel so locked into those. It's, and we might not even be aware that we're holding them, right. They're just kind of like hanging out like our second skin. So I do think we need the practice to help us see the moment to moment ways that we are, um, engaging and kind of energizing these illusory beliefs. And we start again with this like tiny little modicum of our experience of, you know, having an itch. Like it starts so small to be able to see, you know, so-called reality as it is or recognize sensory experience as it is. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that really sad story? Yes. <laughs> Not directly on the story. Yeah. I've been pondering this notion that an individual trying to know the truth can kind of prevent a group from knowing the truth. Hmm. Or is there this idea that, in a sense, it's like understanding without understanding. It's like the soccer team knows where the game is, but an individual player who tries to know everything is just going to get in the way of everyone else. Hmm. Very interesting. Did folks online hear that? So that is idea that can an individual um, actually get in the way of a group knowing. So the example being like a soccer team, if you have one person who thinks they know what's happening, then they may end up actually getting in the way um, of the whole team succeeding. 
I think that's, that's really, I mean, there's, you know, that kind of like hive like nature. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, you definitely see that just what comes to mind is, uh, you know, the spider whose web has been disturbed acts like, you know, someone who's had a stroke and a vague approximation, you know, so our, what are the webs of knowing, right. That, uh, that we have among us. It's, it's really interesting. I certainly felt under my attachment to really like understanding something and feeling like I knew the truth of something made it harder for me to hear the needs of other people around me. Right. As a whole, we were kind of dumber. Because <laughs> <laughs> of you? <laughs> Appreciate that confession. Yeah. So that was like an idea that like if one person is so thinking they know and get away the, and get in the way of the whole And yeah, you know, I think um, as has been very well written about in contemporary cross-cultural psychology, increasingly many parts of the modern world are more individualistic than we've ever experienced in the past, that we think both we are the best, but then we're also the worst, right? So I think the acuity of our delusion and our self-centeredness I think we are like gold star. I don't think we've ever had it this good, right? If um, if we're really trying to find a great example of what you're describing, that kind of self-orientation, maybe also getting in the way of our natural state, which is connected. Yeah, it's interesting. That's going a lot of places. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this? on this aspect. What about this word doctrine? I I, kind of trip on it. Um, Anybody have a sense, like, what does that word mean to you? What is a doctrine? Like, I know what it means. And yet it feels like the commandments, right? Like something that comes from far away to tell you what to do. Um, But I think doctrine is meant to be just a system and set of beliefs, right? And those are really useful. I mean, the other, the other part here is, you know, it's really great to believe in things. It's really great to have shared beliefs. And I think here the Buddha is using this most extreme example of how do you get so entangled in your beliefs that it actually gets in the way not to believe in nothing, but to just see that cost. Um, So then he gives this horrible. um, Oh, hi, Claudia. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment on the story that you shared of of this man who thought his son was burned. Uh, Yeah. I I read um, some time ago a a novel that was so powerful. uh, the Island of Sea Women, I think it was. And what I what I was thinking about is that besides, uh, you know, being attached to a particular view, also like destructive emotions can yeah. create, I mean, this man had grief. In the novel that I read, it was about a deep friendship that um, gets ruined by something that happens. And then there is deep resentment and anger mm. and no forgiveness. And In the process, one of the characters loses out a lot, you know, including the wedding of her daughter or whatever. So I was just Mm -hmm. thinking that it was not just the doctrines or the views of the doctrines, but also our our destructive emotions that can you know create those barriers and and that do not, Mm. I mean, really deprive us of freedom and uh, yeah, and, and don't allow us to see you know, the whole reality, yeah. I guess the truth in some ways. So I don't know, it just, yeah. uh, that story reminded me and oh my God, it's it's so poignant. It's so yeah. powerful. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I love that connection you're making. I mean, you're essentially, it's, uh, we're kind of seeing how, you know, an emotion that's destructive, it actually can create its own doctrine, right? So if I'm like, that person hurt me, mm. right? And so I feel pain, but I'm holding on to it. Right. And then there's this, like, they are bad. 
Right. right. And then I'm stuck in it. Like they're always bad. And, and there's the rumination and they're not understanding, right? Like that yeah. uh, conditioning or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And prevent us also from yeah. having compassion or, yeah. So uh, I mm -hmm. know, it's very, very, very powerful. Eve. Thanks for mm -hmm. sharing that. Women. yeah thank you yeah yeah and then uh so then he tells this this really depressing story and he said um uh the teacher guy yeah the other teacher guy and then the teacher guy says but what of your own teaching if someone follows your teaching will he become caught in narrow views and the Buddha says, my teaching is not a doctrine. Oh, so I read already, but I'll say it again. It is not a doctrine or philosophy. It is not the result of discursive thought or mental conjecture, like various philosophies, which, which contend that the fundamental essence of the universe is fire, water, earth, wind, or spirit, or that the universe is either finite or infinite, temporal or eternal. So he's saying, he is, you know, he is not trying to put forth an idea of a creator of gods or goddesses or, you know, fire or water or being the sense. Mental conjecture and discursive thought about the truth are like ants crawling around the rim of a bowl. They never get anywhere. So my teaching is not a philosophy. It's the result of direct experience. The things I say come from my own experience and you can confirm them all by your experience. Only direct experience enables us to see the nature of reality. And at that, the teacher prostrates on the ground and said, um, you know, like wonderful, wonderful. But what would happen if a person did perceive your teaching as dogma? So what if someone took your, your teachings that everything is dependently co-arising as dogma? And the Buddha was quiet for a moment and then nodded his head. It was a very good question. My teaching is not a dogma or a doctrine, but no doubt some people will take it as such. And I must state clearly that my teaching is a method to experience reality. It is not reality itself. Just as a finger pointing at the moon is not the moon itself. An intelligent person makes use of the finger to see the moon. <clears throat> a person who looks only at the finger and mistakes it for the moon will never see the real moon. My teaching is a means of practice, not something to hold on to or to worship. My teaching is like a raft used to cross the river. Only a fool would carry the raft around after he had already reached the other side, the shore of liberation. So again, this that that is another analogy often quoted, um, this raft to get to the other side of the river. It's it's so it's so powerful. It's tough though. Like I'm definitely not giving up my Buddhist books anytime soon. Like my raft is like a safety raft in this world. And I and I don't think it they can necessarily hold me back. What I do see, especially in our contemporary culture, is definitely more like what Trogyam Trimpa would say is our spiritual materialism, right? That we kind of fill ourselves with new items of interest. And it's really great to get new teachings. It's wonderful. But we can almost start to like latch on to the teachings as being the most important part and not our direct experience, not our meditation, not our own insights, right? And so I'm so grateful we're here together and I get to be a teacher with you tonight, but I'm gonna be the first one to say that this is only part of your journey, right? We have to do that self-exploration. It's helpful to do together. And I do think, you know, this idea of kind of carrying our raft along with us it's interesting. It kind of inspires me that maybe next week we really should sit almost in silence together. Just a little bit of meditation instruction at the beginning and at the end. I, I don't know what you all practice on your own, um, but it's guided practices, I think, are wonderful. You never graduate from them. I, I always hear people say, yeah, I used to like guided practices, but now I like silence. And I'm like, 
what's really going on in your silence? Do you like find a little like bliss out place and you just want to hang out there? Are you really like sharpening your attention? Are you really getting into spacious awareness? And so there's a couple sides of it, but yeah, this idea of, you know, what are we relying on for our practice? Are we overly relying on it and getting in the way of our true insight, truly experiencing for ourselves what's being pointed to? I think that was part of my question about the sound. Mm. Turn around it because it's like a crutch. On some level, I like it. Yeah. You know, like it, on one hand, it, it definitely helps me in front of That doesn't bother me exactly, but then I'm also sort of patting myself on the back for not being like bothered by the sound. <laughs> Man, the ego is like so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's really important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I do think it's, it's so personal how people practice and what they practice. And we really have to make it our own personal Dharma period. And I think it's good if we get really familiar with one practice to mix it up and try something different just so that we are kind of giving ourselves that opportunity to make sure we're not falling into a little bit of self-congratulation or just like, you know, surfing the rapids on our raft and like not going to the other side. Right. What are we um, getting caught with? But here, there's going to be sound here. So we can always appreciate that. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting, you know, the finger pointed at the moon and, um, how we bring that into our personal relationship with teachings and practice and something meaningful to reflect on. But it happens like all over the place where we confuse um, the real thing for something that's just leading to the real thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So the last, the last parts I wanted to share here. Um, the reason we did this Vedana practice tonight, this teacher then says, please, how can I be free from painful feelings? And the Buddha said, there are three kinds of feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. All have roots in the perception of mind and body. Feelings arise and pass away like any other material or mental phenomena. I teach the method of looking deeply in order to illuminate the nature and source of feelings, whether they are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. When you can see the source of your feelings, you'll understand their nature. You will see that feelings are important, and gradually you will remain undisturbed by their arising and passing away. Almost all painful feelings have their source in an incorrect way of looking at reality. Okay, so I'm going to pause there for a moment and just reread this one part. When you can see the source of your feelings, you will understand their nature. You will see that feelings are impermanent and gradually you will remain undisturbed by their arising and passing away. So I think this, this part of our direct experience, you know, this goes back a little bit to what Claudia was talking about is our emotions. And can we really actually directly experience our emotion arising and passing away? Or do we kind of engage in our emotion? Um, do we kind of perpetuate it by rumination? Or do we actually not notice it's slipping away because we're distracting ourselves so intensely? You know, I think that's a big one. Um, and that's not really you're not really kind of giving yourself the space to let the emotion have its natural course when you distract. So what are, what are some of our favorite distraction techniques in the room? Like if you're feeling stressed or frustrated, snacking. snacking. Yeah. The, the sutta of pastries is, is deep in this room. You, you missed a couple of weeks in a row. We've been talking about pastry. So thank you for that. Perfect. Um, what else? What else are ways of distracting away from watching the natural course of an emotion? Reading. Reading. Yeah. Which feels wholesome, right? Yeah. But you're like completely zoning away. Yeah. 
What was that? Um, which which of the many? Just like anything. Yeah, like the news. <laughs> May said just picking it up. Um, yeah. And I think it's so interesting. I know I've mentioned this here before. Um, I noticed for myself, I, I haven't engaged in social media much in the last couple of years. And um, part of it was really noticing the really getting really clear on what was the feeling I was actually having when I picked up the phone. And then what was the feeling I had when I put it down and it was not an improvement, right? What I wanted, like I felt lonely or I felt out of touch. And then very often when I put it down, I felt lonely <laughs> and out of touch, you know, and like, and actually usually like, extra heaping of comparison that like there are other people who weren't right. So it, it didn't support that. Um, any, anyone else, any other creative strategies? The people, people, totally controlling and managing, controlling and managing people like, like texting and getting reassurance or just like imagining that you can like, you know, socially engineer a situation. Yeah. Yeah. Socially engineering a situation to try to make it better. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or worse. Or or worse. It's just different. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So. I mean, right? Like sometimes in order to avoid our own feeling, we pick a fight. Right? Like a different feeling. You know, because if we're feeling powerless and sad, it might be like you. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is potentially a controversial one, but sometimes I think anxiety in itself is an avoidance strategy. Ooh, interesting. Anxiety in itself is an avoidance strategy. Say more. Um, I think a lot of times what I do is I sit with what is the feeling under all of the noise. Yeah. And only when I access that does the anxiety or the craving distractions dissipate. Right. So that leads me to believe that it's, it's a layer, deeper layer than maybe YouTube, but it's still one of those. Layers. Yeah. So um, he's describing that, you know, when actually sitting with the experience that's difficult and like getting beneath it, essentially, yeah, then the anxiety can dissipate. And so it's almost like anxiety is a coping mechanism. Yeah. And I, I would I would term that as what's called a secondary emotion. Right. And it's like it's such a bad strategy. Right. Like anxiety is like so bad. And yet it is slightly more, you know, empowered than like heartbreak you know, maybe, or sadness. And yeah, it, it's interesting. And I think, of course, we find that um, anger can also be another one of those ways to distract away from sadness, loneliness. I mean, I feel like in my first person, me search of picking up my phone, um, it was definitely loneliness, sadness that I didn't want to be with. And sitting with the sadness, like just one beat longer, it's so great, you know, like it really can be so great. And I sometimes worry, you know, I'm, I'm in a field where um, the study and practice of, of well-being in the secular context is the work I do. And I think it's really important we do that work. But if we're always like applying strategies, you know, like write your gratitude journal, listen to an appealing song, take a walk. Are we really like, are we really seeing the emotion to its end? Are we really getting that wisdom hit that this is actually going to go away? So I think it's up to us to really use our wisdom of sometimes like, let's have the pastry. Sometimes let's connect with people. Let's do the things that can be supportive because it's too much to bear. But also sometimes like sit with it. Be with it see its true nature because you know it will rise and fall it'll just like that motorcycle it will go away if we don't if we hold it in that bare attention not like why am i feeling this why am i not but just notice that feeling wave of attention like we do in the practice of the handshake with emotion right where we feel the embodied experience of emotion and then watch it dissipate it's what will naturally happen. Um, so I'll read just this last part of the passage here. 
You will see that all feelings are impermanent and gradually you will remain undisturbed by their arising and passing away. Almost all painful feelings have their source in an incorrect way of looking at reality. When you uproot these erroneous views, suffering ceases. Erroneous views cause people to consider the impermanent to be permanent. And ignorance is the source of all suffering. We practice the way of awareness in order to overcome ignorance. One must look deeply into things in order to penetrate their true nature. One cannot overcome ignorance through prayers and offerings. I love that. Um, and again, ignorance here, it sounds like a very, very like tough word, but ignorance is, is not seeing the impermanent nature. Believing our emotions will always be how we feel, right? That's what really gets us in trouble. And we can't just uh, prayer and offerings. I like that idea. Like, I feel bad. Let me make an offering and pray about it. Like, it's kind of like gratitude journaling or walking, right? It, it might help us in a short term, but maybe not get us to the, the true liberation, um, the kind of real way to get underneath these feelings altogether. Oh. Let's take a moment to dedicate the merit together. <clears throat> So invite just a sense of softening and returning inward. considering if there's any benefit of our time here together, if there's any way that these teachings have inspired us or made us curious. We actually use that as part of our offering and part of our practice here. Every single thread of it leads to being able to support the liberation of all beings. And so we take this heartfelt aspiration that anything that we are doing here together may be of benefit so that all beings could feel safe, that all beings could feel belonging, that all beings could know the true sources of happiness, and dedicating our time here together that all beings could be free. Thank you all. Um, who here? It's their first time tonight. I see a couple new faces. Hey, welcome. Uh, if you feel so inclined, you know, introduce yourself to someone and say hi. Uh, we are an entirely volunteer run center and we pay San Francisco rent. So please help us. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can support us. Um, different kinds of donations. You can also support us by being a volunteer. Who's an awesome volunteer in this room? 